Hey all, this is Neo once again from the Overshot Magazine. So I had previously spoken, I don't think this was on video, but I had said something about just going through the numbers um, for the Core Ultra 9285K. I was fortunate enough through ASUS, the local ASUS, to be able to get my hands on a Core Ultra 9285K. And that's the one I used for the Apex review, which you can check out in the description below or somewhere above. So without further delay on my side, Let's get to it. If something comes up that I need to explain, I'll definitely do that. But as usual, the first thing that comes up is, uh, in my benchmarks at least, is IDA64 memory bandwidth. So you'll see here at the top that the 285K, that's a voltage frequency optimized is right at the top. Um, that's running DDR5 8600CL38. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly rather, the 14700K, this also voltage frequency optimized but running 8000 CL36 comes in at about 10 gigabytes a second less, at least where the reads are concerned. By default, the 285K runs DDR5-5600. I chose CL26 because I always want to give the system the best opportunity to perform as well as it can out the box. And CL26-5600 seems to work. Memory latency. So I've heard people say latency has a lot to do with why the 285K isn't performing as what we may have expected. I mean, if you look at the 14700K that's been voltage frequency optimized, you can see that the memory latency is 53 nanoseconds. Now compared to the closest the 285K can get is 68 nanoseconds. That's 15 nanoseconds higher. So obviously that's going to have some sort of impact, or at least I'm told it will have some sort of impact on gaming. Either way, latency is not really great on the 285K, and it is an improvement over default, which is like 81 nanoseconds. And while the perf performance improvement is massive, 81 to 68 is nothing to, you know, to, to, to just disregard, it's a lot. But unfortunately, it's nowhere near where it should be. In fact, it's slower or rather the latency is higher than the 14700k at default which is not really good right anyway let's look at cpu package power so before i go further into this i was told later on that the readings that we're getting from the software aren't necessarily accurate so just take these with a grain of salt they're just generally what i found using hw info Power consumption, especially where gaming goes. So that's the green part, right? That's the green line. That's the one I'm concerned about. That huge, huge gains that Intel has made. I mean, if you look at um, the 14700K, that's voltage frequency optimized. That's the lowest power draw I could get to get the right performance, right? Better performance. 152 watts while playing Hitman. Now compare that with 107 watts on the 285k that's also voltage frequency optimized that's insane that is absolutely insane that also translates into the package temperature so we get a 10 degree drop in temperatures between the 14700k and the 285k for the same game and all at stock i think the temperatures are really good here i'm not counting cinebench because that will be all over the place but yeah the temperatures particularly for gaming are really really good the 285k versus the 14700k 10 degree drop in temperature that's awesome and of course as well a drop in power consumption so really really good stuff where that part is concerned 285k tops the charts i mean yeah, those, those e-cores, wow, just what Intel has done. I think the p-cores are underwhelming for most people, where the real magic is, is the e-cores, and they seem to overclock well. I didn't overclock my e-cores, so everything that you see here that's voltage frequency optimized is not an overclock. So that means the e-cores are actually still running at 4.6 gigahertz, and the p-cores are running at the standard 5.4 gigahertz when all cores are loaded. The voltage frequency optimization was to allow the CPU to actually get and maintain these clock frequencies, whereas that's not the case if you just run default. What happens is that you either run into a thermal limit, uh, you run into power limit or a combination of the two, which then affects the clocks. But I wanted to avoid that. So I wanted to create that thermal headroom and that power headroom that would allow the CPU to reach its at least advertised clock speeds, which is 5.4 gigahertz for all core frequency and um, all core loads rather, and 4.6 gigahertz for the e-cores. 
that is absolutely insane that the 285k is able to do that so in terms of productivity and multi-threaded workloads at least according to these two benchmarks this is a resounding success for the cpu cinebench is another one we're looking at a score of 2509 points for cinebench 2024 man that is really impressive for 24 thread cpu that is mighty mighty impressive and i think the ryzen 9 7950 x as a reference is proof of that 32 threads versus 24 and when you overclock the or rather optimize the 285k you get even over 2600 which is a really powerful score next up is handbrake i mean this speaks for itself just wipe out you know the core ultra 9285k is beating the optimized 14700k and that's another one i didn't speak to you about so the 14700k when it's voltage frequency optimized again keeps the same thing so its e cores are running at 4.3 gigahertz all 12 of them p cores are running all the time at 5.5 gigahertz and with the capability of doing 5.7 gigahertz as per specification right all i'm doing as with the 285k is making sure that there is enough thermal and power headroom for the cpu to actually stay at those clock speeds cpu z this one is here for giggles i sorted this out by single core result and of course the 14700k is just walking away with it um 944 versus 912 or rather 920 for the 285k at its best it's it's not even close you know it's just not even close multi-thread test of course the 285k just walks all over everybody here or every cpu in this lineup but yeah it's not a fair comparison i'd say we then get to geekbench 6 so single core results the 285k again is mighty mighty strong i think the ipc has come a long way where intel has done the work where it comes to the p cores and the e cores not much to say here it is exactly as you would expect it's scaling exactly the way you would expect so yeah i'm gonna quickly move on here oh there's the geekbench 3 memory score again i was surprised actually that the 285k could beat the 14700k um even though it's by a little bit but i didn't expect this to be the case but here we are uh even geekbench 3 memory score seems to favor the voltage frequency optimized 285k run at ddr5 8600 uh super pi oh yeah this this was strange for me this was strange uh i thought super pi would be really strong um given that the 285k can run 5.7 gigahertz and it actually was running 5.7 gigahertz throughout the run so it's not like it suffered low clock speeds i didn't expect it to come in significantly slower than the 14700k in this test because the 14700K also runs 5.7 gigahertz and we've established that IPC is improved on Arrow Lake versus Raptor Lake. However, because SuperPi is super memory sensitive, you saw the results of how challenged latency-wise the 285K is, right? And I think this is being brought to bear here with the SuperPi. I mean, just standard DDR5 5600CL26 on the 14700k is whipping the pants out of an optimized 285k i mean really what would you need to do to get from 317 seconds to 283 seconds that's a lot of overclocking and if you don't touch the clock speed i don't know what kind of memory speed and timings you're gonna have to run to make up for this deficit but anyway let's move on why cruncher is the next one um here we actually see the 285k isn't as poorly performing as i thought it would be it's definitely faster than the voltage frequency optimized 14700k and it's actually only losing to the 7950x and that's to be expected if only because of just the pure thread count advantage that the 7950x has yeah so 3d mark cpu profile and performance test cpu mark speaks for itself once again the 285k is just running circles around everything that i have here so there's not really much to say here the scores are just so much more dominant than on the 7950x i don't know about the 9950x as i have i don't have results for that i haven't tested it myself but from what i see here yeah the 285k really is good at this finally we get to the gaming benchmarks so this is where things get a little bit interesting okay now from the numbers that i showed earlier you would think okay this should be good this should be good um 
the numbers, it's been winning on the other benchmarks, right? It's been winning. But when it comes to the game, then, hey, I tried, right? The 14700K, voltage frequency optimized, man. In Hitman, number one, 431 FPS, 248, 1% lows. Even out the box, the 14700K is faster than everything else here. Now, this is the part that I did not expect and this it hurt my feeling. How is a standard 7950X? A DDR5 5200CL24. Faster than an optimized 285K. Running high D2D, NGU, DDR5, 8600, tuned sub timings. Why? How is this happening? This is, and but that's not the greatest disappointment. The disappointment of the 285K coming in below the Ryzen 5 9600X. Yes, all of these frame rates are playable. I guarantee you, I, I, in this particular game, if I put you in front of any of these systems configured accordingly and asked you to tell the difference, you would not be able to without a frame rate count. But it shouldn't be possible for a Ryzen 5 9600X to outdo the 285K in anything anything it doesn't have to be just this game in anything and here we are that's anyway forza horizon 5 again we see the voltage frequency optimized 14700k just dominate right at least in the one percent lows the average frame rate is all much much the same of course this doesn't apply to the core ultra 9285k because for some reason 214 frames per second when every other person is or every other cpu is doing 220 plus like why now the crazy thing is that the one percent lows actually go up a lot when you start optimizing and in fact they manage to beat the 7950x and the 9600x at stock why we couldn't start here before i don't know but yeah this this is it is what it is and then we get to cyberpunk so this one hmm again the 285k is losing to the 9600x which should not be the case that should definitely not be the case and how it loses is quite remarkable particularly the average frame rates how are you at 175 in the for the 285k and the 9600x is at 214 why why what happened you know and then when you overclock the 9600x right and then it just further moves away from in fact it's almost 50 fps higher than the 285k when it's overclocked the 285k does claw back some performance particularly in the one percent lows where you you can see that optimizing it takes it from a 1% low of 100 frames per second, 217. That's a 17% increase in performance. That's really good. 175 to 195. So we're getting 20 FPS gain there in performance. That's really good. But again, a stock 7950X, a DDR5 CL24 is faster than that. Why is this happening? This is, oh man, it's, I don't like seeing this. But either way, let's get to Red Dead Redemption 2. So this one is an interesting one. This is the one that 285K actually won if you sort the results by 1% lows. And the reason I sorted the results by 1% lows is because the difference there is larger than the difference in the average frame rates. I mean, the worst average frame rate is like 198, which I don't need to tell you who won that. And then you look at the best which is like the 9600x 198 to 214 it's just 16 frames per second more right but if you go from just looking at the one percent lows the same 9600x giving you 104 frames per second the lower end to the 285k giving you 132 frames per second that's a much bigger gap that's a much bigger gap and that's the reason i sorted by one percent lows here, ish, yo, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. This, this is not good. Um, but I am glad that I'm seeing the 285K finally win something in the gaming benchmarks. And yeah, these 1% lows are really, really good. Even out the box, it actually outdoes the 
optimized 14700K. And yeah, I think this is more than playable. So well done to the 285K for actually winning a gaming related benchmark. I will give this to the 285K. We then get to Dying Light. And here yeah, the 285K actually isn't bad at all. I mean, the 1% lows match the 9600X with uh, PBO applied. And the average frame rate is actually pretty good. In fact, it only, it only, it's only second rather to the 14700K at 264 FPS. And it has better 1% lows. So yeah, I think the 285K here when it's optimized could claim to be winning. But when it's not optimized, it's almost at the bottom. In fact, it is at the bottom. So yeah, it is what it is. So in Black Mist Wukong, what we're seeing is the 285K again come out on top, but only with the 1% lows, not the average frame rate. So you're looking at like the 14700K is like really low out the box, right? At 61 FPS but the 285K is like 75 FPS, right? So that's a big difference. The average frame rates here are pretty much neck and neck. So it's the 1% lows that make a difference. And here, once again, the 285K optimized is actually winning. And I think I'll have that at least as another victory to the 285K. It's not legitimate because it's overclocked, but listen, we'll give the CPU as much wins as it can get when it comes to gaming. So those are my results. These are the results that I have for the 285K. I was gonna do a full on review and all of that other stuff, but I think you know everything you need to know about the CPU at this point. I'm more excited about the motherboards, the DRAM overclocking, and essentially trying to bring up this sort of performance that we're seeing here. And the most obvious way to do that on our end as end users is gonna be through tweaking memory, the die-to-die -die ratios and all of that other stuff. On Intel side, it might be the micro code updates, motherboard side virus updates, Microsoft side operating system updates, all of that other stuff. But in as far as what we can do as end users, we just have these dials. And fortunately, Intel this time has a lot of tuning dials. So you can clock your SOC separate from your base clock, separate from your other clocks all these clock domains, frequency, to, I mean, uh, voltage rails and so forth. So we can actually do a lot on our side. But as it is right now, I, what do you make of the CPU? Look, I understand Intel did what they did in terms of increasing um, efficiency in terms of power. They did a remarkable job there and that is commendable, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what your end users, or at least gamers, let me not say end users, because there's many more end users than gamers, but let's not just assume that end users would appreciate that. If their agency isn't in power consumption, then it's not gonna work for them to tell them that you've improved power consumption. If their agency is in gaming performance, that's what they're looking at. And it stands to reason that people who want their PCs for gaming are not buying the CPU because there are better alternatives and not only from AMD, but from Intel itself at a lower price. That will give you a better gaming experience overall. But productivity goes, and if you care for that sort of thing, and if you care for power consumption, and I think those two things are closely related in that if you're doing these long projects that are multi-threaded and you need also to balance that against cost in terms of your business or whatever, the Core Ultra series make absolutely more sense than Raptor Lake. Just the uh, power efficiency is just so much better and the performance for that power efficiency. And in that regard, I can imagine people who are like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. But for gamers, it ain't it, you know? So yeah, make of that what you will. This has been a very long video, the longest video I've ever made and it's raw, uncut, I think. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the 285K. Have a good one. I'll see you guys on the flip side. Peace.